It's about time for us to get started. Um, would everybody uh, stand for a moment to uh, get the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Mike is uh, volunteered to give us the invitation this morning, so I will hand you the microphone. Okay, let's bow our heads for a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. We, uh, we thank you for the position that you put us in to be stewards of this great country that uh, you created, that you inspired. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would guide this meeting, that you would guide the words that we would say, that you would open our minds, our hearts, let us learn, let us be, uh, again, good stewards, and be able to uh, do your will to be uh, uh, pres preservation-oriented uh, people in this country, and uh, may it all be honoring to you and pleasing, for we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, how many uh, people are here for the uh, first time? Can I see a show of hands? Right here. <laughs> there you go. We're glad you could join us today. Be sure to sign the uh, sign-up sheet outside if you want to get on our email list, etc. Um, about us, we are a conservative grassroots organization. We're about two and a half years old right now, and uh, what we do is we try to identify. Uh, fellow conservatives, get them interested in what we're doing. Uh, once they get interested, we help to uh, help them to get better informed. Those who are uh, inclined to become more actively involved, we help to do that. And those who are involved, we try to empower. So they can have uh, the most effective voice they can in our political situation. Um, we are Republicans and Democrats, independents. We're a big tent. Uh, the one thing we are is that we're all conservatives, and uh, our primary rule is that we always have to keep things simple. Otherwise, uh, the microphone is available to all, and uh, we welcome different opinions. Uh, before I uh, go on to uh, candidates and uh, uh, elected officials, uh, you had an announcement from the Oaks. Why don't you come on up and uh, make your announcement? Good morning. My name is Colleen Smith. I'm with the Oaks Family Care Center in Brunswick. We're a short distance um, down 303 on the right hand side. Many of you have seen us. We are a crisis pregnancy center and we also specialize in helping families. Our main goal is to provide the free pregnancy uh, test in order to counsel women to keep their babies and then afterwards we provide many services to help them and support them. We also provide many free services to the family. Our goal is to have strong family units in Medina County. Uh, we are celebrating an open house on August 19th, and I would like to invite you to that. We were able to double our size, which means that we are able to provide even more services to Medina County. So I'd like to invite you, your families, your grandchildren. We are having activities for the children, free food, very important. And um, you can come and see our facility and what we're all about. And we would love to have you August 19th from 2 to 8 at Oaks Family Care Center. Thank you so much. We just heard about Oaks ourselves a little bit, a little bit ago, and uh, Lisa, Anaki, etc. have been uh, working with them quite a bit. We're very impressed with what they're doing, and uh, we brought the uh, right to life up to take a look at them, and they were pretty impressed too. So thanks for coming by and giving us your announcement. Okay, elected officials, uh, other than our guest speaker. We have Nancy Abbott with us, Municipal Court Clerk, and Nancy, you're also a candidate. Why don't you stand up for a minute so everybody can see you. All right, thank you, Mr. Bentley. I am Nancy Abbott. I am your Clerk of Court for the Medina Municipal Court. They will be on the ballot in November, so if you live in the northern two-thirds of the county, when you go to vote on these very important issues we're going to hear about, please also check next to Abbott. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, we are very pleased that uh, Nancy's been with us uh, ever since we started, been a good supporter, 
and we support her. She's the kind of uh, elected officials we like to have. Also, we have Larry Alhoff, state senator for Medina County, Wayne Ashman, who just stepped in. Uh, and and he, he's a good tag team with uh, Speaker Batchelder. Uh, stand up, Larry, there might be some people. Oh, yes, right. Well, and, speak, and speaking of announcements, where is Janie Grill? Would you like to take a victory lap, Janie? Sometimes they'll uh, get pretty radical in the streets. Hopefully they'll win. that won't happen. But it was just last Friday we heard that on the last day they could file a, a challenge, legal challenge. They did. Uh, and that put us all into a dither. We went into emergency mode. We needed another 20,000 signatures by what appeared to be August 25th. So uh, we scrambled. And like Jamie says, in less than a week we collected 700, which if you divide... 88 counties into uh, 20,000 uh, is a big number. Uh, in fact, uh, one out of every 25 signatures in the state so far came from Medina County. So even if you divide 25 in 20,000, you get about 750 signatures that were needed in that three, four week period. We got 700 in a week, less than a week. So uh, we, we can definitely scramble. I did have an opportunity to uh, look at the merit briefs uh, in the case. 
the Attorney General made pretty much the same argument that I would have, that hired contractors are not employees. You know, they're temporary employees. Uh, but the Ohio Project came up with another uh, interesting aspect that uh, of the 62,000 signatures that they were challenging because uh, somebody didn't fill out the back page properly and etc. Uh, over 400 of those signatures were Ohio Project volunteers and they didn't have to fill that information out. In fact, one of them was the vice chairman of the Ohio Liberty Council, who was probably the number two man uh, in the Ohio Project. They even challenged his. If I had been a Supreme Court judge, I would have said, you guys get out of here. You, don't, you haven't done your homework. Do you? I gotta say, the dumbest thing about that is these idiots. Didn't even look at our petitions. There's names at the bottom of one of the people that put this all together for us, and they were calling him a paid petitioner. So, Jim gave me hard time just shoot that information to me earlier in the week. And I was just hoping Larry could tell us what he thought about uh, about the 7-0. Well, I think it speaks for itself. 7-0 uh, is uh, it's not an easy number to get. I think the speaker might have an opinion on that too. He's a former judge. Uh, but 7-0 uh, but, but in a week uh, it wasn't much merit. I had the second thing I wanted to say, and I, I did see uh, people, in, in particular, Danny trying to get to fair last week. And a fourth, I'd say, is probably about right the number of people who said that they had already signed it. And I think that speaks volumes to the level of work that the people in this room put in over the prior six months to a year. Uh, the fact that uh, one out of every four people who walked by the booth had already signed the petition, I think, is, is significant. Uh, so, uh, good job on all the work that everyone put into that. Again, not just in the last week, but really clear back to. Yeah, Medina County was one of the few counties in the state, I think there were about three or four of them, that got a gold star, which means we, we had more than 25% uh, signatures, uh, well, let me put it this way, they uh, measured the number of signatures based upon how many people voted for governor in the last election, and we had more than 25% of the people that voted in the last gubernatorial election had signed that petition in Medina County. More than 25% of the people that voted is a really big number. So, a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, Larry, about how much time did you need for the... Uh, uh, you know, I can do it from right here, too. I don't need to stand there. I just had a couple of quotes from yesterday's decision. Okay, absolutely. I, I just had a couple of quotes from yesterday's decision that I thought people would like to hear. Okay, yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that, because uh, then I can turn the podium over to Bill and... Uh, <laughs> People like to uh, be able to keep on going and going and going. So. Yeah, absolutely, no, no problem. And I, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for sharing your time up here with me. Um, uh, I'll just uh, give you a quick rundown. Uh, yesterday, the Tenth Circuit affirmed uh, our decision from uh, the Florida District Court uh, and found that the individual mandate is unconstitutional. Uh, it was a two-to-one decision. Uh, we actually did get a, a Democrat judge uh, on this panel, uh, a Clinton appointee. Uh, which uh, throughout the various litigation around the country is pretty unusual, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, and, and I think it speaks to the, uh, the arguments that we have and the strength of those arguments. And I just uh, underlined a few quotes from the decision that uh, I thought the people here would be interested in. Uh, we have the court saying that uh, the federal government is acknowledged by all to be one of enumerated powers. Uh, we have the court saying, undoubtedly, the scope of the commerce power must be considered in light of our dual system of government. Uh, so they're talking about federalism, and they say it cannot be extended uh, so as to obliterate the distinction between what is national and what is local. Uh, and you cannot create a completely centralized government. Uh, and then we have um, uh, some statements about the police power and uh, the idea that the, the federal government cannot exercise a general police power. And we have a quote that I think is going to uh, end up in uh, a resolution from the uh, Senate and, and the House this fall about the Tenth Amendment and reaffirming the importance of federalism. Uh, we have the court reminding us that the Constitution uh, doesn't protect uh, the sovereignty of the states for the benefit of the states, it does it for the benefit of the individuals. Uh, they say, you know what, uh, James Madison had this for a reason. He gave us a dual system of government because he wanted to protect individual liberty. He wanted to protect the people. And that, at the end of the day, is what this is all about. So, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, we, we definitely appreciate our state senators dropping by frequently and giving us uh, an update. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, go, go on over to uh, uh, House Speaker Bill Batchelder. I think almost everybody knows about him, very much about him, etc. Uh, he's, he is uh, definitely an icon, not only in Medina County, but throughout the state. And he looks great in a dog muzzle. <laughs> <laughs> you got to see the book that uh, Homer brought us. It shows a picture of him uh, making a very uh, clear graphic statement about uh, being muzzled on the House of Representatives. And, uh, we used to have that not very long ago with Buttigieg in there, right? I mean, it's like the Pelosi Congress, nothing the Republican did ever saw the light of day. So anyway, um, Mr. Batchelder, we're very glad that you're here. We hope to uh, hear what's been done so far, and even more importantly, what's the outlook? Where do we need to go from here? Thank you. That uh, that periodically pops up in a book. Vern Reif used to try to shut me off, and uh, he uh, learned that actually the magnification you get out of the microphone was unnecessary in my case. I could be heard throughout the house chamber without the microphone, and uh, so shutting that off didn't do any good. And uh, so one day he just plain gabbled me down. Uh, so the next day I came in with a, uh, I borrowed my Doberman's uh, muzzle and wore it onto the floor of the house. And <laughs> Rife would look at the ceiling and he would look over at the floor and he, it was hard to ignore a guy with a dog muzzle on the floor of the house. <laughs> and we have a different system now. I let people speak, even though some of them, frankly, don't make much sense. They're Obama Democrats, so that's necessarily so. But uh, we have a very open process, and I'm very proud of the people in my caucus. Uh, they, they support my allowing somebody to, frankly, talk nonsense, because each uh, member represents about 100,000 people or more, in the case of Medina County. And uh, as a result of that, uh, we want to hear from those people. Uh, sometimes uh, we don't want to hear from them too much, but uh, we, <laughs> we have some folks in Cuyahoga County you kind of wonder about, you know, what uh, what happened to them in their early youth. The uh, <laughs> the, uh, the house is a different place. I said uh, when we started our campaign, I said we're going to knock the doors off and open the place up and let the sun shine in. And that's crucial. It's crucial for people to have the opportunity to appear in committees and to testify. And by that, I'm talking about the people, not the lobbyists, not the labor leaders, not the people. When we have uh, hearings uh, on occasion, it takes a long time to get them uh, 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 carried out. Dave Hall is one of my favorite chairmen. Uh, he had two hearings this last year that went till uh, 2 o'clock in the morning in order to let everybody in the room testify. We had uh, a, a situation in which in the budget committee we had to start meeting six days a week in order to get clear through the budget. It was a huge budget. At one point it was uh, 4,000 pages and we wanted to make sure that the members of the committee who were going to recommend this budget to the people on the House floor and to the public uh, knew what was in it. Uh, very, very difficult, but of course we made a lot of changes. We had an eight and a half billion dollar deficit. That's 16 or 17 percent of the total budget. We didn't have it. It wasn't there. Governor Strickland and the Democrat House spent it. So here was our situation. What do you do? Well, what Ohio's done in recent memory is raise taxes. No way. That was not part of the agenda that we ran on. It's not part of the agenda. You always have some people who say, oh, well, gee, this is a great program, or that is. And there are a lot of wonderful programs. If you just sat around and thought up wonderful programs, you could double the expenditure of the state. But the point is that that is not the purpose of state government. It's our job to do as much as we can with what we have, and at the end of that, quick, 
We had all kinds of people who wanted, we had people who were talking about increasing income tax by 40%. That's what it would have taken to make up that deficit. 40% increase in the income tax. Just outrageous. We're living in a time when our people don't have work. We're living in a time when many people have partial work. They don't have the work that they were used to having. The only people that have continuing work are by and large government people. And that's not a very happy situation. And uh, so consequently, we filled the, the budget with cuts in government. We actually, and this I, I was really worried about, we actually cut taxes. We diminished the state income tax pursuant to legislation that had passed much earlier. And people said, well, they got the, the voters don't expect us to do that cut now. After all, we're having hard times. No, I think that's when the people do expect government to make the cuts that have to be made. And so that cut that was passed over by Strickland, they, they did not go through with that. Even though it was in the law, that cut was made by our caucus in the House of Representatives. We did away with uh, the estate tax. Everybody gets taxed as they earn, and all, everybody gets taxed the first time around. But I don't see any reason why you would go back and tax people because they die. That's not quite like a sales tax or an income tax or all the other taxes we have. They've already paid tax on that money. And it discourages people from remaining here. We have people, uh, I've had some very good friends who are well-to-do. Uh, Dave Thomas was one of them at Wendy's. And he moved down to Florida. He came into my office one day. I looked up and there he was and he said, uh, Bill, I'm going to Florida. And I said, well, you always do, Dave. And No, no, he said, I'm moving to Florida. The doctors have told me that I don't have a lot of time and I do not want my family to lose what money we've worked so hard to save. You remember, he was an orphan boy. His life is uh, an American story that just, I mean, it warms your heart. And he had given, on average, $20 million a year to various charities in this state. But now he was being told that they were going to tax everything that he owned at the end of his life. So he went down to Florida, he finished high school down there, he never finished high school. He went down, he, he finished high school, and uh, he was elected to be the lecturer for the graduation. <laughs> he taught some teachers something about that. Uh, he, he, he was just that kind of a guy. But Ohio tax policy drove him out of the state. We have people paying in income tax here who are very well-to-do people, and they end up paying income tax even though they're out of the state for six months of the year. Guess what happens in terms of their buying uh, into Ohio corporations, new startups, uh, investing so that there are new jobs created in this state? Well, they're not here. So they don't make those investments. They do national stuff. They invest in other states. But they've been run out in effect of Ohio. We're working on that area so that people can be here uh, less time than that without getting taxed. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, we were able to uh, uh, change some of the tax structure in terms of how it was assessed and so forth. I know what would have happened if the Democrats would have controlled the House. We found what would happen, already printed up. It was sitting there waiting for Strickland to get reelected and put it into place. It was an expanded tax on sales, which would discourage retail all across the state, and on use taxes, which is when you buy something, you owe money uh, if you don't pay a sales tax at the time of the actual sale. It's a, a very burdensome tax for small business. And guess how it was packaged? I'll never forget this as long as I live. They had letters to send out to people who were supposed to be collecting sales tax. And the letter said, we want to help you so that your tax is done right. And we know you want to do your tax right, so we would like to come and help you with that. 
And uh, <laughs> thank God they started it in Dark County. Now, that's a county that uh, does not favor liberals. Uh, and in that county, the word got back through the, their senator and their house member to the governor that this was going on, and they were sending these things out. It was like Strickland never left. Well, he left that day. That whole program was shut down. There, you could see also over there an effort to increase income tax. The paperwork was done to submit as bills to the legislature. There's a difference between the political parties in Ohio. Our governor, uh, who is a character, admittedly, our governor and I can meet regularly and work on what we can do to create new jobs and new business. Two days after the election, he was up in American Greetings, up in Cleveland, at Brooklyn, where they passed a tax on companies. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not enough to tax the individual. And uh, so that company was packed up, ready to move. They were gonna leave the state. 2,000 jobs, very high paid people in many cases. They hire people.